So here we are. Here, uh, Lenore and I am going to spend a little bit of time together. I've known Lenore for hmm, 13, 14 years. Uh, wow. First coming to my retreats. And Lenore is also somebody that I know from the Women's Facilitator Group, which you participated in for the two and a half of the three years of that program. And then more recently, I've known you in terms of your capacity as secretary on the board of Awakening Truth. So, you know, this is a time for us together, but I'm curious, what has you feeling interested in spending time now talking about meditation and trauma and how these things are related? Um, you know, I, I think that I'm just interested in meditation. I'm so deeply interested in meditation and I'm deeply interested in your own practice. Um, and I wouldn't say that I personally um, am aware of really acute, you know, trauma history for me, although I've had some tra traumatic moments, but um, it's really just my interest in your own experience. And because you are, I have always uh, been drawn to you as a meditation teacher, um, that anything that sort of draws you deeper into the practice is of interest to me. Thank you. So my name is Amatana Santi, for those of you who haven't met me yet, and I've been meditating for a while and teaching for a while. And in these last several months, I've been on sabbatical. It's the first time in the 25 years of teaching that I've had a sabbatical. And part of that was just because I got overtired from pouring myself into whatever I could do in response to COVID. And part of it was just a time for consolidation in my own practice. And some of these themes were not academic. They were things that I was touching in my own practice during these last several months. So I'm just emerging out of my sabbatical time and thinking that uh, this topic would be of interest to others and of wanting to have an opportunity to share. So that's what brings me here today. So my first question, Alma, is um, I would just like to give the context start with just context and ask you, what is meditation? Like, um, what is it? What drew you to it? What was the, what is the promise of meditation to you? So I was drawn to meditation in 1979 and the, the promise that I, that I felt at that time was the possibility for radical transformation and the possibility to live a radically free and loving life. And I learned about it in, through stories and examples of meditation masters who exemplified those qualities. And when I went and met them in person, um, I could have a, a felt body sense of the qualities of freedom that they were living with, the qualities of loving kindness that, that pervaded through them, that were embracing of me. And it was very impactful, that it was something that I definitely wanted to live my life and to do what I could to realize, to mature, to have them flow through me. And it's not the inter, the, this discussion isn't about this, but I just wanted to clarify that then you decided to, um, to become a nun, a Buddhist nun. So in my own personal journey, I felt 
that being a nun was going to be the consolidation of my aspiration in a form that was optimally designed to support it, according to what the Buddha had said and talked about, and gave my heart and soul to that until I came to the realization that my own aspiration, which was to do this with everything that I had until I had conviction that it no longer served my highest purpose, until that became evident that my highest purpose, which eventually morphed to include not only the realization of various different levels of freedom, but also the embracing of the wholeness of what it is to be a human being, that together these two were no longer served by remaining as a monastic with the precepts, the bhikkhuni precepts that I had undertaken. So it was once I had conviction that it no longer served me that I made the choice after quite a considerable amount of thought and care to relinquish the precepts and to continue my aspiration um, as a lay person. Thank you. Um, so this is sort of another context question. I'm curious, one, once you disrobed, you talked about, um, a, you know, just a, um, a focus and a conviction to um, really experience humanity. I think you use different words, but he, you know, the humanness. Um, how did it, did that change, did that change your meditation? Did it, um, what happened once you disrobed in terms of your own meditation practice? So that's an important question and it's not an easy one to answer because very shortly after I disrobed, we went through the fires in Santa Rosa and I had a really significant health impact from that that took a few years to come out of. And, and there were other impacts around the, the Santa Rosa fires escalated my mom's decline and I was taking care of her. So the circumstances very shortly after I disrobed, meant that it was difficult to separate out cause and effect, what was causing what. And because my health was so challenged and compromised, I didn't come in with an even slate of a place from which I could view and discern. So while it's an important question, I don't have a simple answer for it. So is it Am I hearing you say that you there were changes and um, but it's just it was a very complicated time and there were a lot of conditions that were coming in and it's it's very unclear to I mean clearly there's no you wouldn't be able to say oh you know the fires caused this to happen to my practice or you know this change caused this but there was a lot of shifting and a lot of other conditions all around you that were affecting you in your practice? So my health changed dramatically. And with my health changing dramatically, I was in a, a challenge situation just to manage basic things. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a challenge situation like that, which is the simplest, most basic things are challenged, then your system moves more into survival mode than it is in a reflective capacity where discernment is operating with the access to the resources that it ordinarily has. Mm -hmm. And um, so when did you start noticing? Well, um, Tell me about practice in when in the presence of trauma. Like, when did you start noticing the presence of trauma? Hmm. 
So I think when I left England and I was living as a solitary monastic in Colorado, I was very impacted by some of the things that had happened in England before I left. And my, I was under the influence of that. And that was causing an impact on my discernment, my ability to focus, and some of the other ways in which my system was challenged to come to the same level of quietude and rest that I had in the past been able to access. So when I was in Colorado, I was living right close to the Garden of the Gods. And so the Garden of the Gods became a, a portal for me to be able to access what had previously been something that was more available to me just within meditation. And it was during that time when I was in Colorado that I began to get more of a sense of the way in which traumatic events and trauma in the system can impact the ability to focus and concentrate, but also the way in which when there's unresolved trauma in the system, how the ordinary path of progression or a, the path of progression, which is, which is, can be experienced, can activate trauma rather than activate insight. And so watching the way, for example, the experience of emptiness, ordinarily, it's, it is common before entering into experience of emptiness that there's a certain levels of fear that arise in the meditator before their mind body system relaxes and releases into that experience of what is boundless. But when there's trauma in the system, that a close encounter with emptiness reverberates along the trauma lines. And rather than moving into the emptiness, which is a boundless experience, which is experienced also with a deep sense of well being and ease it contracts around the trauma line into the experience of lack of safety and fear. And so the way in which trauma overlaps with meditation is that it, it means that what one needs and the, the way one interprets experiences can be different and the response that one needs can be different. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Um, so I'm imagining that um, working with meditation students that have trauma in their system, what you just said is it's it doesn't it doesn't always progress in a way that might be expected or make sense or? So there's a couple things. One is that the, the normal path of progress can be different. The other is, is that meditation teachers are slowly coming on board with what's helpful for people with trauma, but not to the proportion and the degree to which the students are actually experiencing trauma. And the, the general basic instructions for meditation presumes lack of trauma in your system as the starting point. So something just as simple as sit still, close your eyes and pay attention to what's arising is not available to somebody who's dealing with a lot of trauma. And if you're in a retreat situation or even going to a talk and the first thing that you do is you're in a quiet space without a relational contact with people and sitting for 30 minutes or 45 minutes and the instructions are, or the context is, is that everybody's sitting there with their eyes closed, not moving. And that can be anxiety producing or it can cause a sense of disquiet or it can cause a sense of um, just agitation in the system. And so what, what I have been noticing working with my students is that this period of time with the pandemic, that people's anxiety levels are much elevated and traumas that 
in the past had some modicum of control or either not being managed as well or they're being compounded by the other stresses that we are navigating. So we don't just have the pandemic as a solitary pandemic. We have several different things that are happening simultaneously in our culture right now. And the overlap of the stress is causing elevated levels of anxiety and trauma responses in people who are not um, aware of the fact that they are holding or carrying or dealing with trauma. Um, so when I say this, what happens for you? I think it's a, um, I, I think I'm feeling, um, just the, the layering of what's present right now in our culture and um, just how complicated that can be and just feeling a lot of um, tenderness towards people and their struggles right now. And so the Meditation is designed to help give us tools and resources to deal with the complexity and to deal with the layers and to bring about more ease. And yet when there isn't a trauma-informed response, then what can happen is adding more layers of complexity. Something which is meant to be helpful actually ends up being exacerbating rather than relieving or releasing. And rather than coming out feeling calm and settled, we can come out feeling more agitated and confused and not necessarily understanding why. And so the way I look at it is, is that meditation is like a bell curve and the ordinary instructions are designed for people who are in the middle of the bell curve, where they're not coming, where their systems are inundated with anxiety and under the influence of trauma. And yet, many people and increasing numbers of people are at the front end of this curve where that's what they're experiencing. And so what's needed is the understanding of the whole territory and understanding that when people are dealing with this, that they need accommodations and that the instructions in the meditation need to be sensitive to where people are at to give people the tools, access to these tools without asking them to uh, do things that then could potentially be exacerbating. And to normalize the kinds of, hmm, like for example, when I was talking earlier about the fear that precedes the experience of vastness or emptiness as a normal meditator journey. And yet when you are with trauma in your body, then what happens is, is, is that you go back into a trauma vortex rather than into the capacity to be with that fear and relax and release into emptiness. And so in that specific example, what's needed is to shift gears out of that intensive meditation and resource oneself with the sense of safety and comfort and confidence and belonging and support to be able to move through the layer of trauma to be able to then reconnect with the meditative journey at a way that is appropriate. Mm. So how do you do that? <laughs> As a teacher, how has this changed how you, how you teach, how you work with, with students, what you're trying to teach them? I think what I'm trying to teach them is to meet their experience where they're at with increasing levels of skill and compassion. And I think what has shifted is my discernment and my attunement to what can be needed at different stages for different people and how people can 
um, develop skills and resources themselves, as well as seek out support that is geared to being helpful. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason why I was happy to talk about these things today is that I was, I was in coming out of sabbatical, I want to begin with um, just a, a question and comment time where people can just come and ask questions and have an opportunity to speak about what's going on in their practice. But also I'm interested in developing more curriculum around bringing forward trauma-informed mindfulness throughout the whole experience of meditation. Because even when a person has decades of meditation experience, they can still have the impact of unresolved trauma influencing what's happening for them. And to understand that, to develop the skills and the tools and the resources to, to normalize it, to make sense out of it, and then to be appropriate in one's response. So this is just to let folks know, okay, I haven't dissolved. <laughs> I'm here, I'm coming back into the world and happy to talk and share about what my own experience has been, but also in, in developing more thoughtfulness and how to move forward together in a way that is actually supportive. Thank you. Well, thanks for asking great questions. I, I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any last comments you want to make about trauma and meditation? I guess the only thing that comes to mind is that trauma is very much a conditioned phenomena. It happens as the result of certain conditions and it has an impact on our conditions. It has an impact on our body and our nervous system. It has an impact. On our brain, it has an impact on our the ways in which meditation is to be more skillful with developing responses to the conditions, but to whatever level it is available to us to touch into what is unconditioned, then that really also helps us titrate between the tightness and the fear and the contraction that it comes with trauma and the gifts and the, and the benefits and the blessings of waking up to increasing levels of who and what we are that is not determined by our conditions. That feels hopeful. Um, it feels relevant to our world right now. Thank you. So thank you, yes, thank you. So I will be posting more information about Q and Cs and when they are available and um, stay tuned. Thank you. Bye for thank now. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.